Rakshandra, great to have you on our program, The Business Detective. To begin, what are some of the challenges faced by our education system which needs to be fixed urgently? Thank you, Dinesh, for inviting me, and I'm um, uh, very happy to talk about education. Actually, the problems with education in our country are uh, like uh, three, uh, there are three main aspects. One is the general education, the higher education, and the vocational education. And of course, professional education is there. Uh, I don't see much problem there. The general education has to be transformed into something that is futuristic in order to prepare the children for the world that they are going to face in the future. I don't know if uh, I understand that there are some reforms coming, but the point is I have not seen them. Uh, something that I would be very interested in seeing is a large content of the future education for the general uh, education to be embedded with STEM team education, that is science, technology, engineering, aesthetics, and uh, you know, uh, uh, mathematics education. Children, uh, this is a natural thing for children. I have seen uh, the small kids. They take to STEM uh, as a natural experience in their life. So uh, putting them into the education uh, on STEM is going to be one of the best uh, approaches for the future. Then on the second that, you know, we are talking about when the students leave general education to join the universities, they are put into different streams and uh, the streams that uh, people, students get selected at the higher education level um, are really uh, of uh, our past uh, historical streams. It is not futuristic. It is not multidisciplinary. It is not bringing people to understand the real life problems that they have to face. So it is a, a big, there we need a huge reform. And um, that for that, we need to really restructure the 75% arts and management commerce graduates who are coming out from the university and the 25% that go in the other areas of science, uh, medicine, engineering, agriculture, and all those other uh, small numbers coming out in the professional direction. But those areas, now medicine and uh, engineering are two areas where there is multidisciplinarity right from the beginning. But when it comes to science, uh, agriculture, and uh, the other areas, uh, there are N number of major weaknesses because when you look at the agriculture students, they are all in management jobs in the offices, but not in the field. When we take the science students, most of them are really looking for, groping for what they could be doing after they pass out. So these things all have to be channeled in certain directions so that they can be uh, uh, getting into uh, a, a job area. A, world of work, that is what we say, future-ready workforce. So we, we are not preparing them for that. Then in the vocational side, I think, you know, one of the <clears throat> things is that our vocational institutes are still not uh, future-ready. We started uh, uh, working on them uh, from time to time, but we still haven't got them aligned with the, uh, you know, world of work. World of work has really changed far and wide. And it's mainly technology based and engineering and, you know, uh, multidisciplinary approaches to uh, uh, the vocational education side. And we are not really preparing our people for that kind of thing. Our people, the few people who uh, go overseas really get into the work uh, in the factories, in the shop floors, are uh, not really uh, trained, well trained at the highest skill levels to take up these jobs at the, in, the, uh, uh, in the outside world of work. So, but they happen to go there and pick up and then gradually build up their skills and they continue to uh, develop their skills. Now, uh, in, in, the, in this, all these three areas, so we need major, major reforms uh, aiming the world of work. But one of the biggest problems in our country is whether it is vocational training, general education, or the, the, the higher education, they only talk about making a, preparing a good student, uh, a useful student. 
but we don't define what is goodness, what is usefulness, what we, what are the characteristics of this goodness that we are expecting from these students. You cannot escape the fact that we are now preparing students for the for the work that they are going to face in the world of work. So we have to understand the world of work. What are the different diversity of the world of work, and then prepare the students for that world of work. That is what I am trying to say. Okay, doctor. Another problem we have is that we have 1.2 million trisha drivers in the country, and I think some research that was done about a year ago sh showed very clearly about 30 percent of them are educated youth. Uh, how do we get these guys into industry? I recall an exercise that we did at the, uh, the Human Resource Development Council sometime back, I think about four years back or so. The, there were 1.4 uh, million uh, people engaged with 1. Point, about 1 million or 1.2 million uh, revealers. I think the numbers must be quite different now. And the numbers, are, uh, the people numbers must be increasing quite a bit. So we really need to uh, you know, put them into a uh, better area by developing their mindset and their, uh, uh, you know, the attraction for the other areas. What is happening is the attraction of the three-wheel area is far greater to the youth than uh, the other areas. Now, this is happening even in the after COVID in uh, the Western world when people are leaving jobs to take different jobs, you see, the great resignation. But we can, you know, in Sri Lanka, if we really have a transformation of the economy, where the people will have better uh, attractive areas to get to work, I think, you know, these people who are driving the three-wheelers will change their um, attitude. Number two is we do not have a public transport system in our country. I mean, that's a very, I mean, sad to say that, you know, the train services are failing people, then the uh, bus services are failing people. We do not have good uh, rolling stock. We do not have good, uh, uh, you know, buses uh, on the road. And there are no schedules, uh, proper schedules. And these are all huge problems that people face uh, in a day-to-day -day life. And, they, you know, the wild uh, strikes that are going on in these transport sector is putting people into great difficulty. So these are some of the big issues. But definitely the three wheel uh, people, not the three wheels, but the three wheel people can be transformed into uh, doing better things if the, uh, our general transport system improves. Because then people have a choice now. Now people are using three wheelers because they do not have another choice. So that's something that we need to uh, do. Yeah. Okay. Doctor, I know you have been talking about talking a lot about how, what we should do with our Middle East workers. You have been saying that instead of sending maids, we should send medical care workers and all that so that they can earn more. How, yeah. how come we have failed so far? Well, uh, it is because there are two things. Now, uh, in the, the hospital service, these are all uh, unionized operations in the, uh, the, the, the health services. I think, you know, in no country is, uh, you know, saddled with this kind of unionism. Number two is that, you know, the private sector is not putting enough efforts into do the uh, training uh, to match the required standards overseas. Now, recently I had a conversation with, a, uh, uh, you know, ambassador overseas uh, when uh, he had vacancies for health workers, particularly nurses. And he said, that to get our nurses certified to uh, their requirements, then they will have ready jobs. So at the outset itself, they'll be certified. So this is a thing, I think, you know, we cannot ask the government to be doing that, but we can ask the private sector to be doing that. Uh, I mean, if when they see the attraction of higher pay, higher salaries, and, you know, when they're ready to join, I think, uh, to get better pay, I think, you know, uh, they will be ready to get certified trained. It is only a matter of facing a test, uh, like the, uh, you know, we know that IELTS is a test, and sometimes people have to face it three, four times to get uh, the relevant marks uh, that they want to uh, migrate. So basically, we need to really get them uh, to face the test and then test it for, learn it for themselves that where their weakness, weaknesses are. Okay. Uh, doctor, also another challenge that we have is uh, we need to stop the brain drain. 
we are losing good talent to countries like Australia, United Kingdom and Canada. What is your advice to the government? Number one is people uh, who are trained here, they need uh, places to work. In our country, I haven't seen, uh, uh, other than in the government sector, there any place for the trained people to work. In the private sector, they do not have enough uh, opportunities to work in the private sector. But both these things are very important because uh, the government service is not productive because they are overstaffed and you know we know it very well that it's a very unproductive uh, operation so we need to cut down the government operations by about 50 percent and then increase the private operations by about more than a hundred percent how do we really do the hundred percent of uh, increase in the production in the in the in the uh, private sector in the industry so for that we have to go for a production economy so the production economy concept is something that we really need to develop and I have been working on that production economy and you know uh, you know developed a system which I really working on through uh, the science foundation basically this is something that we can talk about some other time yes okay okay uh, doctor I know you are doing this data collection project I know it's very important because we take decisions without proper data uh, can you uh, share with us the progress you have made so far absolutely yes Actually, you know, what I have done is uh, the, um, uh, that my belief is that we have to uh, have the production growth in our country to, for the economy to grow. I mean, there are three, you know, this is directly one of the GDP approaches that, you know, the production and the data, what we have collected so far at the central bank and the, uh, the, the Department of Census and Statistics is available and I have gathered all the data that is there on the central bank from the uh, 2021 report and every uh, bit of data is there I have gone through them and then you know develop these clusters and there are other sub clusters uh, for the uh, de uh, decision makers to look at and then also uh, uh, you know the in, in line with these clusters there are a multiplicity of problems. Where are these problems? These problems are in the value chains of these clusters. So the value chains come into play and you know uh, sometimes when you look at production they only worry about these uh, for example agriculture they will only worry about the agriculture fertilizer and the plant and all that. There is much more to it than that. The value chain is like you know the input logistics, the processing, the output logistics marketing and the service and then you can you know have other supporting uh, uh, aspects of the value chain uh, many many i have calculated i have worked on about 38 of that and you know build that into a into a uh, digital uh, model so i can pick a, uh, a cluster and then i can show you what has happened in the cluster if i have experts with me I can get the experts to comment on that and also take it to the ground level. Now, there is no point of choosing what are the problems. Uh, we have to take the solutions to the ground level. So I have developed a link going to the grammar level to uh, connect with the grammar level people who are active at the grammar level to, uh, to, to support this uh, development work. So in all three sectors, the agriculture, industry, and service sectors, uh, I have developed that system. What we need to de do now is actually to see this uh, uh, infrastructure that is developed. We, of course, have the experts. We have more than 3,000 experts who are connected. They are, they are live and they are connected to us uh, at the National Science Foundation. But on the uh, ground uh, level operation, we now are now looking into how we can engage the ground level uh, people and we have to use some of the official uh, government channels also to support this to make it happen so if that happens i think you know this will be live very soon it will be active and we can take a few sample production areas and then prove the point because now the food crisis is coming so the food crisis can be tackled very uh, effectively with uh, information uh, from a digital level 
to get the messages across and get the responses also quickly. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Chandra. I have two other quick questions. One is the Sri Lankan economy is in a very precarious situation. In your way, what is the way forward? Well, production growth. Basically, I mean, the immediate solutions are, of course, you know, the government is working on that. I don't, I, I, I mean, basically, we wanted the government to go to the IMF a long time back when, the, when we saw this happening in the country. Nobody really, I mean, they thought that they can solve this problem by, you know, home solution. There is no home solution for this. You see, so basically, you've got to do the right thing. The right thing is to go to the multilaterals and IMF is the key source. So you go on to the IMF, but then there's a process with IMF. It's going to take time now. So because what we should have done about two years back, now we have to do now, and then we have to wait for those, that uh, gestation period to happen. And then the negotiations to take place to get the all the uh, bondholders uh, agreeable. So basically, that's a huge operation. So And there is a price to pay for that. And you know all that has to be considered. But in the meantime, we need to really get the people to understand the whole problem in our country is that we are not telling the people in our country the truth. If we start talking the truth every day, the, even the same message, it is okay if it is told several times so that it sort of gets drilled into their heads that this is a hard time. Do the part that you have to do responsibly. For example, the food crisis. People have to plant at least one or two few seeds at their garden in a flower pot even to make something out of that, you see. So otherwise, we will not be coming out of this. And also our foreign workers, the message that I can give to the foreign workers is, you know, please remit your, uh, your, your earnings through the banking system. Don't go to Hawala. Please, please. Because otherwise, you know, we are not going to find a solution to this whole problem. The third thing is, you know, this is, uh, Dinesh, it's very, very important because the people who are trying to help us are multilaterals and the foreign companies and the World Bank and things like that and the United Nations. Now, they need to have confidence about us. How do they get confidence about us? By seeing all of us working together in a, for one purpose and, you know, shedding all our, you know, differences on political grounds and all these other um, you know, personal motives, basically come together on the national goals that we want to uh, prepare. So what is the national agenda that we need to agree? I, I think, you know, it's, a, it's, it's something that is, you know, the time wasting that we are trying to do the bigger things like changing constitutions, changing all these, you know, uh, un impossible things that can, you, that can take you to the Supreme Court and delay your uh, success. We really need to do the national agenda agreeable to everybody and then show it to the world. This is what we want to do for the future. And this is the time frame for that. And then only we can get into real action. And then our fiscal policies and the monetary policies will emerge with that. You know, once we do the digital operations, uh, understanding the data without, you know, if the understanding the scientific and, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the quantitative information, there is no evidence-based solutions that are coming into the picture. So this is something that I need to tell you, that get all the parties, the politicians to come together to uh, understand the national priorities. Yes. Okay. Uh, doctor, my final question is you have been uh, in the private sector, plus you have been a vice chancellor, uh, you have been engaged in education. What would, your legacy, what would you want your legacy to be finally? <laughs> you know, I never thought about myself as a man who uh, create a legacy. But there is, of course, uh, something that I am really proud about, that is bringing entrepreneurial education into the country and instituting it successfully. And then also bringing multidisciplinary education into the country and then you know, practically applying it. And then also applying the STEM and STEAM educations uh, into the, uh, the uh, higher education model and also doing some work on the uh, secondary education, uh, and then also, uh, you know, uh, standing up uh, upright uh, against, uh, you know, uh, people who are uh, trying to uh, divert your attention with all kinds of corrupt um, uh, things in their uh, mind. You know, so I've stood up to a lot of people 
against them and you know I have never gone after any job but I have really have wanted to you know help uh, the country uh, to do its uh, right for economic development and that is what I'm doing even uh, now so that's uh, the thing I don't know whether it is a legacy but the point is this is what I did so I don't I, I don't consider I don't have a uh, you know, tagline to say that you know, <laughs> this is my legacy. <laughs> okay. So, so thank you, Doctor. Great talking to you, and all the best in all your endeavors. Thank you very much, Dinesh. Yes. Okay. Yeah.